Our scripture today is from 2 Timothy 3.16. He took it easy on me. No difficult words. It's pretty short. Thank you. (laughs) All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Short and sweet. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, church, are we in a good mood today? There we go. All right, you guys seem a little, a little, uh, a little tired after the events of last night, a little bit till night now, and now you're awake. All right, good to be with you. Those online, hello to you as well as we finish a sermon series. Oh, I know it is sad, isn't it? But Yes. Well, as we're here today, uh, we know that all good things must come to an end. And uh, as we're here today, we know the Lord will continue to bless us in wherever we go from here. If you want to mention, uh, if you have been with us, we've been looking at sort of the, the creeds, especially the line of the creed that talks about the nature of the church. And uh, again, that's one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic are the four terms that are used within the church of what it means to be a church. We've been looking at that every single week. Now, last week we covered, uh, technically we started with apostolic, and we actually got into the Catholic part, but today I wanted to revisit those two ideas, once again, with just a different light, if you will. I want to take you to uh, a fact that's often quoted in our world, and that is, uh, a lot of times people ask, well, when was the Bible canon, as far as the New Testament, canon? And what I mean by that is, when was it officially stamped with the rubber stamp, as far as these are the books, and these are the books, amen, and hallelujah, these are them, and none others. And if you ever study your church history, you would know that that happens in the late 300s. So almost 400 A.D. is when that, that happened. Now, if you leave the story right there, you probably would make some really, really bad assumptions about that fact and what, how the Bible came together. We're going to be looking at that here today in a little more depth. But I want to take you back to that early church in the hundreds, specifically about 125 to 150 A.D. or so when the church was having to deal with all of a sudden the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ was being taken by people and being deliberately, not just accidentally or some honest mistake, deliberately changed and altered that fundamentally changed the message in many dramatic ways. And we already looked at Gnosticism quite a bit, and today we're going to look a little bit more at this guy named Marcion and what he taught and believed. Because the church had to deal with him. Now, if you remember from last week, how the church dealt with some of these early people is they said, hey, First of all, they went to this idea of being apostolic. And they basically made this argument, hey, our church comes from a lineage of the apostle that came to our town, who then appointed this person to serve after them, and this person to serve after them. This is not the message that we had. And that's what we mean by apostolic, is that by that third generation or fourth generation, they could trace the lineage of where the apostles went out and where they started churches and who they appointed to be in charge of those churches. That message went back to the actual apostles themselves. And so when these people had changed the gospel itself and went around and talked about it, they said, that is not the message we received. And again, that would have been powerful on its own right, but then the Catholic part of that, the universal church, if you will, said this, all of the people that had the apostolic succession came together and said, hey, those are not the message we received. This is the message we received. And so they set up what is known as kind of like the Apostle Creed. They set up the creeds and they made that argument as far as apostolic succession in the sense that this message is the same message we all receive, and we can trace it back to the apostles themselves. And Gnosticism, you are not the message that any of us heard. And furthermore, they went on, and it actually worked for Marcion's teaching too. They said, Marcion, that is not the teaching that we have received. But they went a little further because of what Marcion had done, and I want to tell you a little bit about him today. As you look at Marcion and that early church and what they were having to deal with, it was interesting because Marcion really took it a whole lot further than the Gnostics did. And what I mean by that is he was a skilled administrator. He set up churches. He set up bishops. He set up all sorts of things that there was actually a functional church going on that was a rival church to all the apostolic churches of the time that was specifically had held Marcion's teachings. And he was a much bigger threat on honesty if you look back at time and and what Christianity had to deal with. And his big two things were this. He thought the world itself was evil, so all material things, just like the Gnostics did, were evil. The second thing he believed uh, was this, was that we need to take the Jewish part out of Christianity. If you think about that, that's pretty dramatic, right? 
And so he did not want anything Jewish to deal with Jesus. And he thought that that was an actual changing, or he thought that was actually an embellishment to the actual Gospels, because, of course, being Jewish was evil. And so you see some of this come about. And in fact, for a lot of the ancient world, that was a very palatable thing. To be Jewish as a Gentile, if you will, of everybody else, they didn't really like the Jews for the most part. And so to come and to bow down and to worship a guy named Jesus and to worship him as God, as you know, coming in the flesh, but he was also a Jewish human, was hard to the ancient world, especially the Gentiles. And so actually this became very palatable to the people around. And so he wanted to do those two things, and so he set up this rival church, but he liked, disliked Judaism, as I mentioned. And so he basically would look at Scripture and all the things that people believed at the time and say this about him. He would say, the world's evil, and whoever created it had to be evil or at least ignorant. And so he separated the God of Jesus, as in Jesus' Father when he prays and all these things, from the God of the Old Testament, or the Jews, Jehovah. And so as you go through, he made, he made these ideas. He made a distinction. There was Jehovah who made the world, Jehovah who's arbitrary in his judgments, Jehovah who pursues and chooses a particular people and no one else, Jehovah who's vindictive and angry, Jehovah who keeps grudges of disobedience, and Je Jehovah who's really all about justice, but really kind of an arbitrary justice even at that. And that was the God of the Old Testament, if you will. And then he separated that from the New Testament, and he said, all right, so there's the Father of Jesus, the true God, if you will. And this, that God never wanted the world to be created materially. It was always only supposed to be a spiritual world. Jesus was not born because that would make him evil, right? So he was just a spiritual person that just appeared one day as a grown man and started teaching, was one of his teachings. And he said that there's no judgment as far as what's coming in the end. It's kind of universalist in some way that God is all loving, absolutely all loving, that all of our sins will simply just be forgiven. And that that God of Jesus is really not one that wants to be obeyed. That's not really what it is. It's all about just being loved. And so that God wants us to love that God with all of our hearts, minds, and souls and strength. But again, the obedience part is sort of left out. And of course, naturally you would think what he would do is one day he did something that no one else in Christianity had really done at this point. He said, you know what? I'm going to make an official list of books. A canon, if you will. And he chose to make a canon, and that day he basically chose these, these books. First of all, he chose the letters of the Apostle Paul. And he chose them, he put them, and he said, this, Paul, out of everybody else, got it better than anyone else. And so these are the teachings. And then he got the Gospel of Luke. Only Luke, not the other ones, because they were too Jewish. He got Luke, and he put it in, and he said, this is the Gospel of the true message of Jesus. But he didn't stop there, because if you ever read Paul, if you ever read Luke, there's a whole lot of Jewish parts to that, right? <laughs> And so he went through and edited it and deliberately cut out everything that was in there that referenced the Old Testament, everything that was referencing to Jesus being born, everything that was referenced to Jesus being Jewish, took all of that out, all the different scriptures and all those things, and cut them to make his own ideology and make it work. And when people would question him on this, he basically said, well, all those quotes that, you know, Paul were in Paul or in Luke, all those quotes from the Old Testament, those are the Judaizers who are trying to put interpolations into the actual message of the original message and change it. Now, of course, all the people that actually stem from the apostles, all the churches said, no, <laughs> no, Marcion, that's wrong. And of course, again, they rose up with that idea of being Catholic and apostolic together, and that was enough to defeat it. But even in defeat, that church lingered on for centuries. But then something started to happen. Remember how that story went that, oh, in the 400, like right at the end of the 300s and 400s, the Bible was put in canon? Guess what happens in the hundreds? It starts. Now, I say it starts. That's kind of misleading. What I mean by starts is they actually started making lists. There were no councils or anything like that. There was no power structures. Rome was very hostile to Christians at this time. And so there was no coming together and making a decision. Simply, the different churches of the different areas and their leaders started writing out lists, and they would send letters to each other and compare them to each other and write about which ones are you using, which ones are we using, and they would talk about this idea. And so you started getting these lists of books, right? And you started noticing some themes that were used all across the world by Christians. And so in this idea that it's also true that a lot of times you may hear this, is that when the new church was early, early church, when we read letters like 2 Timothy 3.16 that said that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness, it's true that the early church would have said, when they heard scripture, they would have thought of the Old Testament. However, it's also true that they were using what we call the New Testament books and gospels in worship, using it for teaching, instructing, rebuking, and training for righteousness, just like the Old Testament 
itself. In other words, they were using the New Testament books already like scripture, even though they weren't calling it scripture quite at this moment. And so you got these various churches started making these lists. And now again, this takes centuries to kind of come about before there's an actual official like big church meeting with everybody around the world that sits down and sits down and says, these are the books. However, there was a consensus very quickly about certain ones. And here they are. You ready? Did you hear about them? So by this time, it was very quickly that the Gospels themselves were part of what we should use in Scripture, as part of, quote, unquote, the canon. And everybody agreed on this almost immediately. And almost everybody had the three, but some people didn't left out the fourth, but it took a little bit to get that. But they didn't really argue too much about it either. They eventually very quickly accepted even the fourth Gospel of John as well. And it's interesting that they chose four and made sure that there were four in there specifically to combat Marcion to say, hey, here's two sets of eyeballs that were there with Jesus, and here's another two sets of ears that listened to two other two sets of eyeballs that were with Jesus, and here's their story. And they made sure that even with all the incons there's some you know, little tiny inconsistencies as far as how they tell the story or different ways, the different highlights, the different stories or ways Jesus maybe teaches a specific parable, they left all that in there specifically to still point out, hey, Marcion, you're wrong. Here is the canon, if you will, of of the Gospels and the story. Likewise, the book of Acts and also the Pauline epistles were very quickly established. It became very clear that everybody in the whole known world, in every church, was using the Gospels, was using the book of Acts, and was using the, the New Testament writings of Paul in worship, like Scripture, and training and, and actually using it as a, how you're supposed to act and what you're supposed to believe. And by the end of that second century, if you will, that 100s, at the end of that, it was basically everyone was pretty much in agreement and consensus about those things. And there were a few letters, like for instance, some of those shorter books at the New Testament, as well as Revelation and Hebrews, that took a little longer to get consensus. But there really also wasn't much debate, if you go back and look at it. It was pretty well, even though not everybody was using them all together at once, they quickly became used. And when it was finally brought up, they really didn't argue very much about it. Matter of fact, the, probably the, the book of the Bible that got the most New Testament argument about it was Revelation. And you look at that, you say, uh, is that because it's you know, just crazy, kooky, crazy? No, it's actually not because of all the images and all the stuff. It was actually because a lot of that imagery refers to the Roman Empire, which at this time, when this consensus was happening, they readily agreed on Revelation. But when it came time to make the books, remember, Rome was now Christian at that time. In the 300s, that changes, right? And so by the time they actually sat down to do the books, all of a sudden, this book of Revelation is talking and using all this imagery of Rome being like the fallen city of Babylon and the, the kingdom that's against God, but it's now Christian. And so they really wrestled with that, but ultimately they said, no, this is truly one of the books as well. And so you get this idea that there's almost this consensus at this point. It was being used in every church, the writings of the New Testament. It was these writings that we have here today. That's not the end of the story. Because something else happened in the early church that we oftentimes forget, and that was Rome did not like the Christians. You can see this as early as Nero. That's actually upon the life of the apostles and Domitian, the emperors of Rome. They did not like Christians. There were some persecutions and martyrdoms that took place in that time. In the hundreds, there was actually, we have a later letter from the emperor Trojan, or Trajan, that is, who basically said this. He's writing her out to Pliny, and he says, Hey, as far as Christians, they're becoming a real issue. But here's the deal. Don't seek them out. But if somebody, like, rats them out, make them come before you. And if they come before you and they offer, offer, offer sacrifices to the emperor, let them go, dismiss it. If they don't, persecute them, right? And the idea was this, is that's kind of like, don't, it was like a don't ask, don't, don't tell kind of thing. But if somebody did rat you out, you were in trouble. And that was the kind of issue of the early church. But then there were other times where it was also persecuted. There were times under Emperor Marcus Aurelius. In the 200s, he started getting real persecution, not just kind of really in small little buckets, but actually kind of local areas where persecution would happen. It was Septimus Severus, Decius, and Valerian all persecuted the early Christians, destroyed any of their buildings, went after their scriptures, went after them, and started persecuting them. And then the worst of it came in the early 300s, like right at the turn, right at like 302 AD kind of idea. Became horrible for Christians. And here's the story of how this happened. There was an emperor at the time named Diocletian, 
And Diocletian was sick and tired. He was a good administrator, and he was sick and tired of all the civil wars to fight over when somebody died, the Augustus died, and Caesar died. Who became the next person? And so there's all these uh, civil war that would take place whenever this would happen. He says, all right, we're going to divide up the whole Roman Empire into four areas. And so two of them were kind of like big bosses. And two of them were like bosses in training. So you have like the, the presidents and the VPs, if you will, right? And Diocletian was the president. Well, here's the only problem. It was a day of a lot of peace. There was a lot of trade, a lot of good things. It was a wonderful kingdom. Things were going really well for Diocletian, except for in one of the provinces, which was Galerius. He was kind of like the VP, if you will. He's, he's, in, he's in training to become a Caesar one day. And the problem there was that he had to keep finding the Germanic tribes, and he needed an army actually to go on campaigns and things like that. And the problem was Christians would deny the draft. They wouldn't fight. And early Christians also would make an argument. There was a lot of discussion about could you be in the military or not. And actually, if you don't know, this has been a constant debate within church. The church has never come to consensus on this in its church discussions as far as, you know, is pacifism the way of Christianity or is kind of a just war theory the way of Christianity. But specifically, remember, this is the early church, and Roman guards and, and, uh, and soldiers, that was, had to do horrendous things. And if you were ordered to do something, you had to do it, right? And it wasn't like our army today that had some restrictions on what is moral. There was no morality. If you were in the army, it was simply do what you were told, when you were told, to whoever you were told, at that time, you were told. And so the early church basically said, hey, you can't be a Christian and be in the Roman legion. And so what ended up happening was is you had Christians desert the Roman legion. You had Christians refuse the draft. You had Christians refusing the orders because it wasn't ethical of what they were, they were told to do. And Galerius said, okay, enough of this. And so he wrote to Diocletian, and it started with just them ousting the Christians from the Roman army. They said, hey, boost them out. You're not allowed to be a Christian and be in the army at the same time. Galerius went further than that. He started persecuting them in his own army. He started actually setting up trials and executions and making people deny and offer sacrifices to the, to the gods. Well, this kept going, and Christians just became a thorn in the side, if you will, because of this. They wouldn't serve in the military. And eventually what ended up happening was Diocletian got so fed up with them and, and the Galerius and them that they actually set out this rule that said, hey, from now on, uh, not only are you not allowed to serve in the army, but you have to come and offer sacrifices to the emperor. And so they made Christians come before them, and if you sat there and you sacrificed and you recanted your faith and offered a sacrifice up to the emperor, then you were good, good on your way, stamp of approval, go on about your life. If you didn't, you were in trouble. And it led to persecutions, it led to, to martyrdom, it led to all sorts of things. And then it began even with church buildings being destroyed. It began with not only church buildings being destroyed, but scripture. If you wouldn't give up your scripture, if you were accused and you held the scripture somewhere in you and they found it on you, if you wouldn't burn it and destroy it, or you would hold, if they knew you had some and you held it back, you were killed. In fact, one of the historians I looked up put it this way, is that if you would refuse to give up the New Testament books, you were tortured with refined cruelty and eventually killed in a variety of ways. So the Christians didn't just die to be killed. They were tortured. They were killed in a spectacle kind of way for these books during this time. Now, eventually what ends up happening is Galerius ends up consolidating power, except for one branch of the, the four kingdoms, if you will, of the four branches of the provinces. And the province that he doesn't conquer is a guy named Constantinus Chlorius. Fast forward the story, he has a son. His son's name is Constantine. And what ends up happening in this part of the story is the church goes from the greatest persecution empire-wide of everything being destroyed, every Christian being sought, every Christian being killed, and just being a total victim. So all of a sudden, Constantine rises up, and he comes and he goes, and he uses basically a, a, there's a power vacuum when Galerius gets kind of sick and passes away, and Constantine comes to Rome, sacks Rome, if you will, conquers Rome, and when he does, the night before the, before the big battle, he, he sees a dream. Well, some people say it's a vision, if you look at historians. Some people say he had a vision or experience, or he had a dream the night before. He basically put the chi and the row on the shield of his soldiers. And the chi and the row were the first letters of the Greek alphabet for Christ. You can spell it. So he put the, the symbol of Jesus, if you will, on the shields of the soldiers as they went in and conquered Rome. And one of the first things he did, he put an end all Christian persecution during that time. 
Eventually, Constantine himself would be a convert to Christianity. He would set the whole entire Roman Empire as a Christian empire. And it was a whole different change from that moment because it went from hardcore persecution to all of a sudden pomp and circumstance. Right? And the church had to deal with all sorts of issues it had never dealt before. Where it had to understand it now had power. It now had an easy lifestyle if it so chose. It had now had all these trappings that it had never dealt with before. That's a story for another day. The point I'm trying to make right here is that when it came together, Constantine called a council, and later on there were some other councils towards the end of the 300s. When they came together, my point is this, the books had already chosen themselves. The idea that they sat around a table with hundreds of books and picked these books themselves is false and erroneous. These books were used by the early church. They were used for worship, in worship. They were used to tell people how to go and how to act. They were used to refine one's character. They were used to tell you what you were supposed to believe. They were used for every single way we use Scripture and talk about Scripture. They were using it that, in that exact way in the early church. And after persecution, after persecution, Christians refused to give these Scriptures to them. They knew it was true. Christians that came before us died for these books. These New Testament books that we have here today, the canon that we have, exists because people died for them. Because they wanted you and I to have them in our day. And the people after us. What do we mean by this from Catholic and Apostolic? We not only mean the idea that the church had the teaching and carried it on, but they put it down in book form. The books we have in the New Testament. And the Old Testament, remember, they recognize it too, right? These are the books that all of us can know what God is up to, what God has done in our life, and what is the true message of Jesus Christ, and how it applies to our lives. As we close this sermon series, I hope you've enjoyed it. One of the things truly that the church can't do is get away from the Bible. We do a lot of things, but it cannot do that. It's part of the nature of church. In all those ways that we're always tempted to say, oh, it was just a book written by some people back in the day. No, no, no. It was used in the worship services of the people who walked with Jesus. It was used in the worship service of those that descended from those that walked with Jesus. It was used all the way up through all those centuries, through all the persecutions that refused to give up, even that cost them their own life. That you and I can have it here and today. So church, we're called always to be one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your message. And it's humbling to think about our brothers and sisters who went on the journey before us. But God, when their time came, and the Roman Empire came knocking at their door and told them, hey, recant, serve the emperor, and they refused when they came knocking at their door because they were ratted out and they said, hey, we know you have some scripture, Christian writings. Give it to us. We're going to burn it. And they refused to and they had hit it in such a way that it was preserved for future generations. God, we're humbled that sometimes we come to this book and we just read pages as if it's just a journal or we read pages of it as if it's just a newspaper or an article we read on the internet. God, as your scripture says, it's God be. That, Lord, these are the books that exist today, that were bought with blood, the blood of your people, that were used by your church in the very early days of Christianity. God, as we're here today, we once again look towards it to find you, the full revelation of what you have for us, and how, Lord, we can be here. Lord, bless our efforts, bless our minds. Keep us a church, always faithful to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.